summarizes something that I've been hearing for some time now. And the title is, Choose Blessing. Choose Blessing. And I hope that got your attention. And you're probably already asking, you mean it's something I can choose? I think we all understand what blessing is, and we're going to talk more specifically about that in a moment. But the concept of a blessing is something that we often think just comes by happenstance. Some people get blessed, some people don't. And hopefully it will happen to me, but you never can be too sure. Well, I think this opening scripture is going to set the stage for us to discuss the fact that blessing is indeed something that you and I can choose. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. We can change that to NIV, please. I've set before you life and death. This is God speaking. I've set before you blessings and curses. Now choose. Doesn't sound like much of a choice, does it? How many are going to choose death? Yeah. How many are going to choose cursings? Yeah, bring it on. It seems like a no-brainer. Why would God even say, choose life and choose blessing? Isn't that everybody's desire? I think it is. I think it is. But the fact remains that there are certain choices that bring life and bring blessing and certain choices that bring or result in death and curses. You know, if you really think about your life, and if you think about life in general, it really boils down to a whole series of choices. You make choices, I make choices. Some of them are little. Some of them are what color car to get, or what street to live on. Some of them are far more important. Where am I going to go to school? What career am I going to choose? What job am I going to work at for the better part of my life? What partner am I going to enter into covenant with in marriage? You see, there's a whole range of choices that we make, but they are ours to make. God made us with the ability to choose. He would never tell us to choose something if he hadn't given us that power and that ability. Here's the problem. Jesus said there are two roads. There's a broad road, and most people, the majority, have chosen that road. It's the popular road. It's the well-traveled road. It's the road that everybody's doing it. There's only one problem. It leads to death. The majority have chosen that road, but unfortunately, in doing so, they've chosen death. Jesus said there's a second road. It's narrow. It's not popular. It's not well-traveled. It's actually a very lonely path. And there will be times when you feel like you're all alone on that path. He says, narrow is the way that leads to life. And there are only a few that find it. Or I would change that word for just a moment. There are only a few that choose it. So in the Old Testament, God speaking through Moses says, I've set life, death, 
blessing and cursing you choose. In the New Testament, Jesus says two roads have been placed before us. One is narrow, unpopular, but it leads to life. One is broad. Isn't it interesting? They talk about Broadway. <laughs> the Broadway, everybody's going that way. The popular, easy way, but it ends in death. And so we need to examine this a little more carefully than just saying, sure, Pastor, I choose blessings. Sure, I choose life. Well, again, the title of my message is Choose Blessing. But we need to look a little more deeply into the scriptures this morning to understand exactly what that means. In Matthew chapter 19, there's a very interesting conversation taking place here between Jesus and the Pharisees. And I'm turning you here only to give you a little bit of context as we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. This is something that Jesus often did in his teaching, in his preaching, and in his discourse with the different groups that came to him. He pointed back to how it was in the beginning. And that's why I believe the book of Genesis is so important for us to read, study, and understand because it is the book of beginnings. We need to know where things started from, how they were in the beginning. And that's exactly what Jesus does here in Matthew 19. They're having a discussion about marriage and divorce. And in verse 4 of Matthew 19, here's what Jesus said. Haven't you read? That's a good question. Haven't you read? That at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Of course, he's referring to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. What I want you to notice is how to make his point, he went, first of all, to the Scriptures. Haven't you read? You and I as Christians, we need to understand what the foundation of our life is. It's the scriptures. It's not our opinions. It's not someone else's opinions. It's the eternal word of God. And that's what Jesus did. He appealed to the scriptures and he went all the way back to the way it was in the beginning. Why am I saying all of that? Because if we're going to understand this whole concept of God's blessing upon a person's life, we need to look all the way back to how it was in the beginning. And now I turn you to Genesis chapter 1. And let's see what was it like in the beginning for the first humans. What was it like for Adam and Eve? How was it? in the beginning, and a lot of times when you see how it was in the beginning, it reveals to you something of what God's mind and purpose and heart are. Because when God did it in the beginning, He did it according to His purpose and plan. And in Genesis 1, very similar to where Jesus was quoting actually, we take it from verse 27. Genesis 1, verse 27. What does it say? So man evolved from a monkey. Right? That's what all the biology textbooks say. That's what all the secular science teachers say. God said something different. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and male? Female and female? No. Folks, we need to get this. This is how it was in the beginning. By the way, the evolution 
evolutionists are stumped on this one. They cannot give a good explanation why the majority of animals have both a male and a female. It cannot possibly be explained by evolution. It's easily understood from Genesis. God made them after their kinds, male and female, and he told them to reproduce, to multiply, and to fill the earth. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Three times, it says in one verse, he created, he created, he created. Do you think God wants us to know something here? God is my creator. Hallelujah. Amen. Now what's the next verse say? God what? Bless them. God what? Bless them. Right after he created them, the very next thing God does is bless them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Next verse. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all So, and God saw all, you know I'm going to do this, what's all mean? I didn't hear you. What's all mean? All. God saw all that had evolved by random chance over billions of years? No, God saw all that he, the master designer, the master creator, had made, and it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Let me just summarize very briefly the blessing of God in the beginning on humankind, on our first parents. Adam and Eve. Number one, unlike any other creature, monkeys and apes included, man and only man has this distinction. He was made in the image and likeness of God. Wow, what a blessing. You, my friend, are not a glorified version of an orangutan. Last time I checked, even though monkeys are pretty smart, they're a little bit clever, last time I checked, they don't write books, they don't compose songs, they don't go to the moon, they don't look for cures for cancer. There's a, there's a gulf, a wide gulf between the smartest of all the animals and humans. Why? Because of the way God designed us. He stamped his image inside of us. That's why the Bible says he has set eternity in our hearts. I don't care if you're a believer or not. I mean, don't take that wrong. I do. I want you to be a believer. But you can be an atheist. Maybe somebody listening to this uh, tape sometime, maybe they'll say, ah, he's crazy. I don't believe in any of that stuff. You can be the biggest atheist on the face of the earth, and you still cannot escape it. It's stamped on your inside. You know it. Romans 1 says what man has tried to do is suppress that knowledge, but it's there. We know we're different. We know there's something inside of us that tells us there's a God. It tells us there's something eternal out there. It tells us there's a purpose and a destiny to my life. I'm not just a random collection of molecules floating around in the universe for no purpose. He made them in his own image and likeness. Second thing he told them to do, be fruitful, to increase and to multiply. That's a part of God's blessing. By the way, Mom Tatu, 
is fulfilling that. And I'm so glad for the name she chose for her fifth child. It, it shows that she's now in agreement with my prophetic declaration of 12 children. Because the fifth one she named Israel. I mean, everybody knows 12 tribes, right? So seven more are on the way. She's shaking her head no. We'll leave it at that. Fruitfulness is a blessing. He also gave them absolute dominion and authority over all of the creation. Can you imagine that? Here God has made all of this stuff, and then he tells Adam, you're in charge of it. To the point that a little later in the chapter, we read how every animal came to Adam, and God told Adam, you give them names. The one with the big tall neck he called giraffe. The one with the trunk he called elephant. Adam gave them their names. Amazing. He gave them dominion over all the fish, over all the birds, over all of creation. Fourth, part of that blessing was abundant provision. And I know some of you are fasting, so forgive me for reading about food, but I can't help it. It talks about fruit trees and vegetation and all this abundance of food that was being provided for them by God. And finally, in verse 31, everything about man's original existence, everything about his original condition was very good. Say that with me, very good. Man's life was very good. And when you get into Genesis chapter 2 and you read about the Garden of Eden, this amazing paradise that God placed Adam in, and then how God brought Eve to Adam and made her the mother of all the living, everything about that place was blessed. It was a paradise. You don't find any mention of words like sickness, disease, pain, fear, worry. The only time something negative is mentioned is by way of a warning. God told them, I've put two trees in the middle of the garden. One of them you stay away from, the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat from that tree, you will die. Nothing had ever died. Nothing was dying. Everything about this original creation was life. Why am I giving this lesson from Genesis? Because I want to establish a very important foundation. God loves to bless everything that he makes. God wants to bless you and me. He blessed the whole creation when he made it. And you wonder, yeah, but why is there so much stuff in the world today? You can't possibly tell me it's all God's blessing. Oh, no. No, we're coming to that. In Genesis chapter 3, we begin to understand, at least in part, the answer to that question. And why, in a larger sense, coming back to our opening thought, why is God calling you and me to choose blessing over cursing? Well, you see, Adam and Eve had the ability to choose. And they made a very bad choice in the Garden of Eden, and it had far-reaching Consequences consequences that have affected your life and the life not only of every human being, but of all life on earth and the whole universe was affected by one bad choice that Adam and Eve made. Now, as I was studying this this week, several things jumped out at me. If you have the time and the ability to go through the Bible with a concordance, or a Bible dictionary of some kind, look up the word bless, blessed, blessing. It's all over the 
of the Bible. I counted some 380 times that it's mentioned in scriptures. Very important concept. And so, why when we see such a preponderance in the scriptures about blessing and how God wants to bless us, why do we have the curse? Very important to understand this. In Genesis chapter 3, I think most of us are familiar with this, but it doesn't matter how many times you've studied it, you get more out of it every time you come back to it. Because as we grow, we also grow in our ability to understand some of these simple stories so-called. And in Genesis chapter 3, my Bible titles the whole section, The Fall of Man. The Fall of Man. And without going into a lot of detail this morning, this is something that we've studied in great length on other occasions, but basically the serpent comes to Eve, introduces doubt about several things. First of all, he introduces a doubt about God's character. Does God really want to bless you? Does God really have your highest and best interests at heart, or is he holding something back from you? That was really at the root of Satan's temptation. You see, because it says the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. And when he came to the woman, he said, did God really say? Second doubt he introduces is the word of God. Can you really trust the Word of God? Maybe God isn't being truthful with you. Maybe there are contradictions in the Bible. Maybe some of this is not really meant to be taken literally and on and on and on and on it goes. Did God really say? And by the way, just a side note, most of you know me, you know this is my position. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, whatever it says, I believe it means what it says. I believe there was a literal flood, a literal Noah, a literal ark. I believe there was a literal Jonah. There was a little fish, a literal, not a little fish, a literal fish that swallowed him. I believe these things. I don't have any problem believing that because if you start off in the opening verses of the Bible and you meet a God who in six days created hundreds of billions of galaxies and all the amazing diversity and wonder we see in the creation around us. If he could do that in six days, I don't know about you, my God can do anything. Amen. He can do anything. Amen. Anything. And so this doubt comes. Did God really say? And another side note, I'm getting a lot of free advice this morning. You don't have to pay for it. You better know your scriptures. You better know what the book really says. Because Satan also knows this book. And he will twist it. And they'll try to take a piece of a verse or uh, something out of context. And if you're not really grounded in the word, he can mess with your mind as he did here. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Satan answers, you will not surely die. What is that? What do we call that? This is what Satan's famous for. It's a lie. Would the devil dare lie to you? Hmm. Let me rephrase it. Can the devil say anything to you but a lie? That's what Jesus said. That's his native language. That's all he speaks is lies. So it shouldn't surprise us that he comes right out here and says, God has lied to you. You will not die. And here's the other part that's even far more sinister. How Satan tries to introduce doubt about God's character. And this is very closely connected to what I'm trying to share with you this morning. 
it, he, he introduces doubt as to whether God really loves you. Whether God really wants what's best for you. Why do the majority of people choose to go life their own way and not do it God's way? What's the basis of that? They've made that choice because they think they can find a better life on their own apart from God. Because they've heard this same voice. Listen carefully to the insinuation. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Let me translate this. What the devil's really saying is, Eve, God's holding out on you some blessings. You can get bigger blessings if you do this your own way and stop listening to God's word because he's just holding back some good things that you could be having and enjoying in life. So if you go ahead and eat that tree, you're going to get wise and you're going to be like God. What is he really insinuating? Eve, God doesn't want you to ever be like him. But you can go about it another way and arrive there. I'll show you how. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You know the rest of the story. And I wrote this down. After this one bad choice, remember we're talking about choices today, choose blessing. Eve made a bad choice. Adam made a bad choice. They didn't understand all of the ramifications of what they did that day, but basically what they just did is choose cursing. They chose cursing. Because you see, that's the inevitable consequence of sin, of disobedience, of failure, to trust in God and His love and His goodness. And we don't have to go too far into the story. In verse 14, God starts pronouncing curses right down the line. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing how do you have Adam and Eve to thank? <laughs> I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it. All the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Paul expounds on this at length in the book of Romans. Through one man, death came upon the whole human race. Through one man, the whole creation was subjected to vanity, to decay, and to futility. The whole creation changed that day. Why? God commanded a curse to come because of man's sin. You see, the devil doesn't explain all that to you. He just shows you the pretty tree, the pretty fruit. He says, go ahead. Go ahead. Don't believe that Bible. That's a bunch of nonsense. It'll make you feel better. It'll make you smarter. It'll make you like God. And then after we've eaten it, then we realize the consequences. We've chosen a curse. 
rather than choosing blessing. I made a list of some words that you find only after the fall. These were not a part of the original blessing that God brought upon Adam and Eve. Just listen to the list. Afraid, deceived, cursed, pain, toil, thorns and thistles, sweat, death, evil, banished, anger, and murder. All that's in the first four chapters of the Bible. Right after the fall, we start hearing all these words, curse, deceived, death, painful toil. Nevertheless, God in his goodness, right here we just read in verse 15, God was already planning a way, it would take a, a long period of time to bring it about, but God was already planning a way to do away with this curse and to restore blessing to man and to all of his creation. We don't have time this morning, but if you really are familiar with verse 15, it's the first prophecy in the Bible concerning Jesus Christ. It's actually pointing all the way to Jesus crushing the serpent's head on the cross of Calvary. But more about that later. As time went on, through Abraham, God raises up a nation, the nation of Israel. And he makes a covenant with them. And he gives them laws and statutes and commandments. And he gives them a priesthood and, and, and a whole uh, scheme of laws and statutes to enable them to walk under the blessing of God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, there's a long chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I think it's about 60... Eight verses long. But I'm just going to read a few. You can do the rest for homework. But this is a very important chapter. And the section in my Bible has two subheadings. Blessings for obedience. Curses for disobedience. Do you notice which section is longer? The section for blessings is 14 verses. The section for curses goes from verse 15 all the way to verse 68. And I want to start with verse 1. I'm going to ask you to read some of these verses with me because I want you to get a feeling for God's heart. Even though man had fallen now, even though the creation has come under this curse, you can, you can still feel the heartbeat of God. He wants to bless us. And even with the Israelites, he's giving them laws and commandments, which if they will follow, he promises blessing upon blessing upon blessing. You ready to read with me? I heard one person. Oh, real quiet today. Here we go. Ready? If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. And these... All these... All these what? What's all mean? chase after you. They will pursue you. And they will overtake you. Read it again with me. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city. Some of you probably don't want to be blessed. You're not reading. I get blessed when I read this. Come on. Read with me. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flock. Now, most of us are not farmers, but it's talking about the fruit of your labors. Everything you labor at will be blessed. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. 
You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you instead. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything. What's everything? everything. You need everything? everything. A blessing on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and crops of your ground in the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend the many nations but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always, what's always mean? Always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Now, I don't know about you, I want all that. I want all that. That may sound selfish, but I'll tell you why I want all that. Because God wants me to have that. And God wants you to have that. Because that's who he is. He's a God who delights in blessing even a fallen creation. This is in the Old Testament, before the cross, before Christ. And even here, God is saying, if you'll just obey me, man, I am going to bless you. I worked with a pastor up in Brooklyn, New York. He had this expression, God's going to bless you out of your socks. I never could understand it. He tried to explain it to me, but I just don't get the socks part. But I get the blessed part. God wants to really bless you. It talks about abundant prosperity. It talks about victory and deliverance from any kind of an enemy that will come up against your life. And the part I especially like is whatever you set your hand to do, God will bless you. Is anyone else in this room tired of putting your hands on stuff, wasting money, wasting time, wasting energy, and in the end it brings forth nothing? Anyone else? Do I have any friends today? And I am determined, in whatever days or weeks or months I have left in my life, whatever I do, I want God to establish the work of my hands. I want God to bless the work of my hands. And I want it to bring forth fruit and fruit that remains. Because he promised that in his word. Over and over, you're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. Your barn is going to be blessed. Your business is going to be blessed. Your studies are going to be blessed. Your ministry is going to be blessed. Whatever you do is going to be blessed Amen. by Almighty God. Amen. Not so fast. There's more to the chapter. Verse 15. However, I learned in English, when you see a conjunction like that, pause. Something's changing. The tone is changing. Something different is about to be presented to us now. However, if you, and I'm adding this, if you choose not to obey, and by the way, this is Deuteronomy 28, we started off our service in chapter 30. It's all connected. It's all a part of the same discourse that Moses is having with the children of Israel. And so after he goes through in detail the blessings and the curses, he ends it all in chapter 30 saying, Now, I've set them before you. You choose. Well, if you 
choose not to obey the Lord your God, nor carefully follow all his commands and decrees, all these, all these what? Uh-oh. All these curses will come upon you, and yes, they will also overtake you. Hands up, all those that want to be overtaken with curses. No one. No one in their right mind chooses that. Why have so many been chosen the path that leads to cursing and destruction? And again, I'm not going to read all this. You need to study it on your own, but let, let me give you a real quick synopsis. I just wrote down a summary of some of the words. This is just a quick word list I'm going to read to you, and it's a, it's a summary of all of those curses. See how many of these you like to be a part of your blessing? I think not. Listen to me. Confusion, rebuke, sudden ruin, severe and lingering diseases, scorching heat, drought, fearful plagues, prolonged disasters, defeat, madness, blindness, mental illness, oppression, rape, kidnapping, theft, loss of property, horror, scorn, ridicule, vain and fruitless labor, frustration, captivity, hunger, thirst, nakedness, and dire poverty. Let me tell you something. God is not Santa Claus. Sorry, if, you know, some of you are still believing in that, but I thought I'd wait till Christmas was over to break it to you, but God is not Santa Claus. He's a good God. We saw in the first 14 verses, He's just longing to pour out a blessing on every part of our lives. However, this is what awaits anyone who makes wrong choices. Man, that's the scariest. Scariest. And I guarantee you, there's not a one in this room that wishes anything in this list. Hopefully, you don't even wish it on your enemy if you have one. Confusion. Prolonged disasters. Dire poverty. When God promised them abundant prosperity, their barns, their, their agriculture, their jobs and businesses, everything would be blessed. This doesn't just apply to individuals, it applies to nations. And the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And we're praying during this time of fasting. I'll tell you, I am seriously praying for this nation. We need to intercede. We need to cry out for this land because we're moving rapidly in a direction where the God of this Bible is no longer the God of America. And make no mistake, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the reverse is true also. What happens to a nation when they exterminate God from their schools and they push him out of the courthouse and they don't want God anywhere in their society anymore. Tell me, is God going to bless that nation? Absolutely not. And look at some of the things that we are seeing on a more regular basis here in this nation and in other nations around the world, it's not just the U.S., that are turning their backs on God. Have you seen anything in the news in the last year or so about disasters? Anybody read about prolonged disasters? Anybody hearing anything about poverty? Did you know we have more poverty in the U.S. than we've ever had? 46 million people in America are classified as below the poverty line now. That's a curse, my friend. It's a curse. 
This was once known as the most prosperous, the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth. And yet, most of the people are suffering, trying to get by from one week to the next, while a few elite people steal, rob, and cheat and get richer and richer and richer. Choose blessing. How do we do that? I'm going to make it simple this morning, and I know there are many, many more scriptures than the ones I'm going to use, but I want to make it simple and practical. I want to boil it down to four choices that everyone in this room and everyone listening to this tape can make. These are choices that we make, and these are things straight out of the Word of God, which when we make that choice, God guarantees blessing. Anybody interested? I'm going to ask that again. Anybody interested in getting blessed by God? Yes. Then choose blessing. Remember from our brief discussion in Genesis, the whole reason for the curse was man's sin. And here in Deuteronomy 28, the whole reason for all that long, laundry list of curses is disobedience to God. So we've got a problem. It's called sin. And it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And ultimately, there's only one cure for that disease. Only one. It's not like society would have us to believe that there are many, many different cures. You can do all kinds of things and fix yourself. No, I'm sorry. This disease is so deep. It's been around for so long. And its effects are so far reaching, it only has one cure. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, by his own design, God sent his own son to take the curse. Some of you didn't hear me. Amen. God sent his son to take the curse that you and I richly deserve. And this is the only way to deal with that curse for sin. Follow me carefully here. Galatians 3 verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We just read a synopsis of that curse. That's really what Moses is presenting there in Deuteronomy 28. You break the law, these are the curses. Disease, madness, mental illness, frustration, and all that long list. That's the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by doing what? Waving a magic wand? Signing a new law? No, not so simple by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, and this is from the Old Testament, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. You see, every detail of Jesus' birth, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, and Jesus' resurrection, it was all scripted in the Old Testament through prophets that lived hundreds of years before any of it happened. So that when it happened, everyone would know, wow, this is God. He predicted every detail. Right down to the detail that Jesus was going to be crucified. He wasn't just going to be beaten up and left for dead. He would hang on a tree, crucified like a criminal. And under the law of Moses, only the, the vilest and the basest of criminals were put to death that way. And what it's saying is when someone died by crucifixion, the whole society was acknowledging this individual has been cursed by God. That's what it meant. He's been cursed by God. And make no mistake, Jesus wasn't being cursed by the Romans. He wasn't even being cursed by the Jewish leaders. He was being cursed by God. 
His own Father in heaven had to look away from Him, had to abandon Him on that cross, because the Bible says Jesus became sin. He didn't know any sin. He didn't commit any sin. But He became sin on that cross. And then all of the full power of this curse, confusion, rebuke, ruin, diseases, heat, drought, plagues, disasters, madness, blindness, that whole curse came upon Jesus and he became a curse in our place. Next verse. He redeemed us in order that You know, I'd be very happy just to get the first half, get rid of the curse. But it's better than that. He takes away the curse so that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Amen. Jesus took my curse. Jesus took your curse so that he can bless you. In Acts chapter 3, you remember there was a crippled man that got healed at the temple. Peter and John were there, and the people began to think that maybe these apostles were some kind of gods come down from on high or something. So Peter begins to preach the gospel to them. And he gives an amazing sermon. I'm not going to read all that. But at the very end of his sermon, here's what Peter tells all of the onlookers in that crowd, starting from verse 24. Acts chapter 3, verse 24. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, referring to Jesus, of course, when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to do what? Bless you. To bless you. God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. God sent Jesus to bless me. God sent Jesus to bless you. Apparently that hasn't fully sunk into our spirits yet because when you really get that, it's like, whoa, that's it. That's the whole gospel right there. God sent Jesus to become a curse so that he could bless me. That is some good news. The more you and I study the scriptures, the more we're going to be convinced that Jesus came for one purpose, to bless us. And remember, all the things that are not a part of the blessing, disease, madness, confusion, captivity, frustration, oppression, all things he intends to remove from our lives when he brings that blessing. But in Romans 10, this is a choice that every one of us needs to make. Romans chapter 10, and we all know the verse, but bringing this all together now, we choose blessing, number one, by choosing Jesus Christ. It's a choice. It's a decision. It's not just coming up to this altar and praying a little three-minute prayer and going through some religious motion. No, no, no. It's far greater than that, as we'll see in these verses. Romans 10, starting with verse 
Uh, let's take it from verse 9. Well, verse 8. Romans 10, verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if, note that word, if. It doesn't mean it's a done deal. It means if this happens, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Keep going a little further. As the scripture says, anyone, what's anyone? anyone. How many anyones do I have in here? I'm, some of you are not anyone's? You're no one's? If you're an anyone, there are a lot of beautiful promises in the Bible. Here's one of them. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Next verse. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Listen to this. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, point number one, choose Christ. Make him your Lord and Savior. Surrender your life to Jesus. Declare to your friends, your family, your co-workers, the world that Jesus is your Lord. Tell it without any shame, without any fear, because he, he went to the cross and took your curse so that that blessing can come upon you. Choice number two, Psalm 1. Since I got saved, going on 40 years ago, I was three years old at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm laughing. Mm -hmm. That's true. Over the 40 years that I've been a Christian, I have met many, many, many people in many lands. I've met many pastors, many leaders, big guys and little guys and all kinds of guys in between. And I'll tell you one thing I've observed. One common denominator between all the men and women that I see have been blessed by God, they love the Word of God. They love the Bible. They read the Bible. They study the Bible. They can't get enough of God's Word. They memorize it. They've got them written all over the wall. They've got bumper stickers on their cars. They love the Word of God. For good reason. Psalm 1. Read it with me together. How does it begin? Yes. Blessed. How many want to be blessed? Here's some real good advice. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates every Wednesday night for 40 minutes. And 20 more minutes on Sunday. I want to challenge you for 2014. Get into the Word of God. Amen. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Go over it and over it and over it. Spend hours in it. It's your life. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever. What's whatever mean? Whatever. You mean whatever? We thought the young people invented that word. Whatever he does, prospers. Anybody else in here want that? Hallelujah. Now, I'm not talking about just getting a new Mercedes or a $700,000 house. That's
that's not prosperity. We got to understand our definitions here. But whatever he does is going to prosper. Keep going. Not so wicked. Remember the two roads? The majority are on the broad road that's leading to destruction. They're not getting this blessing. The narrow road, the one less traveled by those who love the word of God, meditate in God's word day and night. They're the ones that are going, going to enjoy that blessing. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Delight yourselves in the word of God. And please, 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 once this time of fasting and prayer is over, we're going to get into some serious Bible study again on Wednesday nights. And if you want the blessing of God, I challenge you. Change your schedule around so you can come to study the Word of God. And you watch your life change. Amen. You watch your life change. Amen. Watch the wisdom that God gives you. And watch how He prospers you even in your work. Amen. I talked to a man this past week. He made a decision some months ago to spend more time in the Word of God. He began to read 10, sometimes 20 chapters of the Bible every day. And he called me recently. He said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. He's a businessman. You're not going to believe this. And I'm not going to tell you the nature of his business. But he said, you're not going to believe this. But in one week, the business that it's taken me almost five years to build up with my own sweat and hard work and struggle, in one week, God doubled it. Doubled it. In one week. And he attributes it to this and nothing else. Brother, it's the Word of God. The Word of God. God told me, whatever I do is going to prosper. And as you get into the Word of God, you're going to find those hundreds of verses that I mentioned that talk about in more detail, which we can't do here this morning, how to get blessed. The Bible talks about blessings that come upon the forgiven. Blessings that come upon those who fear the Lord, those who are faithful to God. And on and on and on it goes. But if we're ignorant of what the book says, we're going to miss out on a lot of the blessing that God has for us. All right, quickly, I want to move on. That's a choice. What's the number one excuse for not reading the Bible? Come on. Help me, Grace. I don't have any time, Pastor. Right? It's amazing how we can carve out time for other things. Pastor, I don't have any time for TV. Oh, really? I don't have any time to eat. I don't have any time to sleep. Now, in all seriousness, I know we're all pressed for time. A lot of us work hard. We have multiple jobs, all kinds of hats to wear. I understand all that, but I also understand if God tells me there's a blessing awaiting me in his word, I'm going to make time somehow. And if you're at a place where you're like, Pastor, I'm pressed. I don't know how to find five more minutes out of my day. Pray and ask God to help you and show you, and he will. Sister Grace was told she would have to work every Sunday. Does everybody see her here? By the way, welcome back from Jamaica. What happened, Grace? Did you pray about it? Did God answer prayer? Did we also pray about it? Did God answer prayer? Pray, folks. Pray and God will help you. She's here now on Sundays. Bless the Lord. All right, third.
third choice. And I want to emphasize, these are choices. You can choose this or you can choose that. There's a choice that's left up to you and to me. And we have many opportunities throughout every single day of our lives to make the right or the wrong choice. Jeremiah chapter 17, starting with verse 5, and we'll read down to verse 8. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 to 8. This is what the Lord says. Uh-oh. There's that word. Why does God keep talking about this? This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wastelands. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And notice in the next verse, it sounds very similar to what we just read in Psalm 1. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries. I like that. Say it has no worries. Tell the person next to you it has no worries. Now tell the other person on the other side, I In a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. What's the key here? One person chose to trust in God, the other person chose to put their trust in man, in man's opinions, in man's strength, sometimes my own. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. I really believe God's bringing this congregation to a new level of faith. He's taking us through different experiences where we're learning to trust Him. And every time we put our trust in the Lord, He comes through. I don't have time this morning. Already since this fast began, we witnessed some amazing miracles just by trusting in God. Nothing else. Not trying to manipulate and make something happen. Just presenting your case to the Lord and watching and waiting to see what He will do. Trust in the Lord. And this isn't something you do only on Sunday morning. It'll happen tomorrow. It'll happen Tuesday. It'll happen all throughout the week. You'll be presented sometimes with little challenges, sometimes with big challenges. This week, Pastor Quasey had a big challenge. He's in the doctor's office, not because he's sick. He's there with his daughter for a checkup. The next thing he knows, he's laid out on the floor, unconscious. They call 911. I had to take him immediately to the hospital. That's a real good time to make a choice. I'm going to trust in my God. I'm going to trust in my God. He will be like a tree planted by the water. I don't know if you get this picture, but I do. This, this flourishing tree. There can be salt and drought and desert all around, but this tree is flourishing because it has chosen to send its roots, number one, down into the Word of God, and number two, by trusting in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Bring your, your needs and your challenges and your problems to the Lord in prayer and trust in Him to change those situations. That's why we're fasting and praying. We believe in a God who can change things. We believe in a God who can break through in situations. 
And it's a decision we make over and over and over. Fourth choice, Acts chapter 20. You know, I remember many years ago, one Christmas, our family and my brother's family, we had all gotten together, and in those days, all of our children were quite small. And his younger niece, I mean, every one of the kids had a pile of gifts this side because grandmas were still living at that time. And there's this huge stack of presents. And my wife's here, she can bear witness to it. In less than five minutes, they tore through every one of them. Just ripped off the ribbons and the paper and opened up every single package. And I'll never forget it. It's just like it happened yesterday. My little niece sat there with a pile of gifts like this that she had just ripped open. And she goes, is that all? <laughs> If ever I was re ready to go to jail for child abuse, it was then. I could have taken a two by four and said, what did you say? Is that all? But you know, we all have that same mentality to a lesser or a greater degree. After all, isn't life all about how many toys I can collect? How much stuff I can possess? The more I have, the wealthier I am. So I got to do all I can do to get and get and get. And then along comes the Word of God, and it messes all that up. In Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 32, Paul is giving his final farewell to the Ephesian pastors and elders. And he says, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. He could boldly announce that was his testimony. He was not in the ministry to get stuff from people to scam them and try to deceive them into sending special blessings and offerings to him. He was not into any of that foolishness. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. You know, when God called Abraham, he pronounced a sevenfold blessing on him in Genesis 12. We don't have time to go into all that now. But many of, of you have heard me speak on this before, and I'm just going to mention it again this morning because it's so appropriate to what we're talking about. The biggest blessing that God promised to Abraham was this one. I will bless you and make you a blessing. The last part. Many of us leave off that last part and we wonder, why isn't God really blessing me? And if you listen to your prayers, many of them are just, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, 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 gimme. God, give me a better job, give me a bigger car, give me more money, give me a new house, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, gimme, gimme. Can I suggest that you start changing your prayer a little bit? Bless me so I can bless other people. Give me a raise in my job so I have more money in my pocket to give away. Bless me more, Lord, so I can give more to the work of God, to missions, to the poor, so I can do something with my life instead of just give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. 
Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. And we just read earlier, all of the nations on the earth were blessed through Abraham. How would you like to be a blessing to a nation? Amen. Many of you have. Maybe you don't even fully realize it, but you have. We sent an offering of $2,000 to a pastor in Lebanon a couple of months ago. We have no idea how many Muslims have come to Christ because of that little offering that we raised from our little church here to send over to Lebanon. And I believe as we learn to give, we can be more and more of a blessing even to nations. The Christmas boxes that we made up and uh, sent out for Samaritan's Purse. Who knows where all those boxes went? Who knows what child somewhere in some desolate place has come to know Jesus Christ because of that little box that one of you packed up? And I believe as we focus our prayers in this direction, Lord, bless me. I believe you want to bless me, but bless me so I can be a blessing to others. You see, when you're self-centered, when it's all about me, you can have a million or a billion dollars and not be blessed. That's not prosperity. Matter of fact, we hear too many stories of people who have all that and they end up committing suicide because they weren't blessed. So just having a lot of toys doesn't mean we're blessed. True blessedness is number one, when we've chosen Jesus Christ to walk on that narrow path that leads to life. Number two, to dedicate our life to the study and the observance of God's word, to delight ourselves in the law of the Lord. Number three, to make a decision, to make a choice, to trust in the Lord. And finally, Make a decision, make a choice that in the year 2014, I'm going to give more. I'm going to give more of my time, more of my money, more of myself. And you're going to be hearing more about this in coming days and weeks. We have a vision. We have a vision for this church. We want to fill this place. Amen. We want to win souls. We want to reach out to this community. And it's going to take every single one of you. And you need to begin to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, what's my part? How can I step out of my comfort zone and do more this year to win souls, to evangelize, to go out and bring in people for the Lord? Otherwise, we can sit and say, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. Why am I not being blessed? Bless me, bless me, bless me. It's more blessed. And I don't think this just refers to money. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes you may be feeling a little bit discouraged or a little bit down. You know what the best thing is to do? Sit there and pout and say, how come nobody from the church is calling me? No, you'll get worse. You know what you need to do? Get out your church phone list. Call three or four people, pray for them, encourage them, tell them that they've been on your heart. By the time you're done, you've forgotten your worries. You feel 100% better because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Will you all stand with me this morning? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1 that in Christ, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All spiritual blessing in Christ. It's already there in Christ. But we need to make some choices. We need to make some decisions. And we were praying about this last night on the phone prayer line. And we understand there are some folks in here that are in a, in a what the Bible calls a valley of decision. You're making some choices. Some of them are big ones. And we need to earnestly pray that those choices and decisions are guided by the principles that we've shared here this morning. Look for the blessing of God on your life. 
Try in every situation to align yourself with the Word of God. What is God saying to me in His Word? And then let me order my steps according to His Word. Let's pray. Father, I honestly don't understand why you want to bless us, except for the fact that that's who you are. I don't understand why you love us, but that's who you are. You are love. And God, in the beginning, we saw how marvelously you blessed your whole creation. How you blessed Adam and Eve and surrounded them with abundance, with a paradise free of any pain, free of any sickness, free of any kind of problem. And yet, Lord, we, not just Adam and Eve, we have all sinned and gone astray. And we've opened the door for all kinds of curses, including that big one called death that resulted from Adam and Eve's disobedience. And still, for all of that, you want to bless us. You sent your own Son to take our curses so that you could bless us. And Father, I am praying today for each and every one of us that in this new year that we are now in, we would make wise choices. We would make God-centered and God-directed decisions. Lord, let us not make the same mistakes that Adam and Eve and the Israelites made of disobeying you and bringing even more curses back upon their lives. Lord, we choose blessing today. We choose to follow you today. We choose to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is our Savior. And I have no other God but Him. Father, I choose to trust in the Lord with all of my heart and not lean on my own understanding. I trust to devote my time and my energies and my resources to not only studying your word, but implementing it and walking it out in my day-to-day -day life. And Father, I make a choice this morning to embrace the cross and to declare I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Lord, we take up our cross. We lay down our selfish desires, our selfish ambitions, and we say yes to your purpose. We say yes to your call upon our lives. And Father, I pray that in this coming year, we would see blessing upon this congregation like we have never seen before. God, release abundant provision, not for our own selfish consumption, but bless us so we can be a blessing. Bless us so this church can give to foreign missions, can help other churches and other ministries. God, get us out of this poverty mentality. Bring us into the wealth and the riches and the prosperity of your kingdom so that we can be a blessing to others. Finally, Lord, bless your people. It's your heart, it's your desire to bless us. And we choose that blessing. And we will walk in that blessing. And we will acknowledge that it has all come from your hand. And so to your name be all the glory and all the praise ever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Word of God came to you from Unite Ministries here in Maryland. Now may the Word of God bless you, strengthen you, and bring you peace as you persevere in your Christian walk. I am Pastor Kwesi Ojenga.